All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, logging on. It's 12.59. We're going to start in about 60 seconds. I like to start on time and end on time. So hang tight. Um, we're going to let some of the people who are still trying to log on get on the call, and we'll start in just a bit. All righty, it is one o'clock by my watch, so let's go ahead and get started. So um, first of all, I want to thank everybody who's taken a little bit of time out of their day today to uh, educate themselves and uh, get a little bit of information about the 1031 exchange process. So um, my name is Leonard Spoto, and I am going to be your host today. Um, this is one of the uh, few times we do escrow only uh, events. A lot of times we'll do, actually we do uh, events all the time. We probably do about four or five um, a month. And we do have uh, kind of a focus on the real estate or the investor perspective. Um, but today's webinar is 1031 Exchange, what escrow needs to know. So we really try to focus uh, on the closing officer and how a 1031 ex exchange is going to affect you. So what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about 1031 exchange, but uh, really kind of dig into some issues that closing agents are dealing with when it relates to 1031 exchanges. So uh, again, my name is Leonard Spoto, and I uh, am going to be the host today. Uh, I am one of the owners of Asset Exchange Company. And uh, if you don't know me, uh, thank you for logging on. Would love to get to know you and how we can benefit your business and your clients. Um, I do have a few sales team members that uh, are uh, also working for me. You might know Weiming Pang or Matt Ferenci. These are my two business development guys in uh, California. So um, a couple of things that I do want to, uh, to mention before we kind of get into the meat and potatoes of the presentation. Uh, first of all, everybody who is on the call is going to get a, uh, an email right after the webinar ends. And in that email will be a copy uh, or a link to download a copy of the presentation. So a lot of people ask me during the calls, hey, can I get a copy of these slides? They're good. I'd love to re review them at some point. And the answer to that is absolutely. So just keep an eye out for your email. Um, usually the email is sent about an hour after the presentation ends. And then the second thing that I get asked about is, hey, what if I have a question during the webinar? How do I get that over to you? Well, questions are encouraged. I want to make sure that you leave this webinar with all of your questions answered. And the way you get a question over to me is you simply type it into the questions dialog box on your control panel. So on your computer screen should be a little control panel for the webinar. One of the sections on that control panel is called questions. Just open it up, type your question in. It'll pop up on my computer screen. And I promise to answer all questions. Now, I may delay answering your questions because it might be related to a topic we're going to cover uh, further in the presentation. So don't worry if I don't answer your question right away. Um, I will answer all questions, even if I have to stay on the call for you know half an hour afterwards if there's a ton of questions. All right? So housekeeping's out of the way. Again, thank you for joining us today. Let's go ahead and get started. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, my company is a 1031 exchange accommodator. Now, because you guys are all closing officers or working for escrow title companies, you probably know what a 1031 exchange company is. Some of you may even have affiliated 1031 exchange uh, partners. So what does an exchange company do? Well, you guys know this. We're going to hold all the funds from the sale of the property in a custodial account. We prepare all the legal required documentation, and many of you are helping us get 
those documents executed, so thank you very much. And then very importantly, we are going to make sure that the client is in compliance with the rules and regulations as set forth in Internal Revenue Code Section 1031. Now, a little bit about my company, and I promise this will be a really short commercial. Um, we were established in 2006 by myself and my business partner, Adam Skarsgård. Um, before uh, we started this company, we worked for a very large uh, exchange company that was a, a national player. That company got sold, and then the bank that bought that company went out of business. So luckily, Adam and I started this company about six months before that big meltdown that happened uh, with uh, the banking industry in 2006. Now, our company, we are located and headquartered in California, so we are required by state law to carry errors and omission insurance and be bonded. Now, you guys probably know what e E&O insurance does. It protects our clients in the event that we make a mistake, and the bonding protects our clients in the event that uh, there is theft of funds. So obviously, we have never had a claim against those insurance policies. Otherwise, we would not be in business. My business partner, Adam Skarsgård, is a tax attorney, so he's a member of the California Board of Accountancy and a member of the state bar. Now, one of the things that makes our company unique in terms of handling exchanges is we are the only company that provides clients with free audit support. And so what we do, and unfortunately we have to do this on an increasing uh, basis nowadays because more of our clients are getting audited, is we help the clients substantiate the position that they took in the 1031 exchange. And that could include giving them all of their documentation and hopefully that's it. But very often it is helping them build a case to substantiate the position that they took in the 1031 exchange. Now, why is that important? Well, that is important because increasingly our clients are getting audited on their 1031 exchanges. And a lot of people think, well, geez, what happens when I get audited? Do I just pay the taxes if my exchange is disqualified? Well, yes and no. In a very good situation, if your exchange is disqualified, and never, it's never really good to have your exchange disqualified, but the best outcome if your exchange is going to get audited is that you just pay your taxes, okay? But that's usually not what happens. Usually what happens is you pay your taxes when your exchange is, is disqualified. You also pay interest and penalties and fines. So it can get very expensive to have a disqualified exchange. And in the most egregious of circumstances, clients do go to jail for tax fraud related to a 1031 exchange. It's happened in the past. In fact, it happened in 2013 to a real estate agent by the name of Cheryl Savage. Now, Cheryl was a realtor. She did her own 1031 exchange because she did not want to pay taxes on about three quarters of a million dollars worth of gain. She knew that tax bill was pretty big. So when she was selling her property, which was a rental property. She claimed in exchange. She used an accommodator. She went out and bought replacement property. But Cheryl's problem was she immediately moved in to the property that she bought. Now, Cheryl was no dummy. She was a real estate agent, and she knew the ins and outs of 1031 exchange. In fact, she knew them so well that she was bragging about her knowledge on her website. And this got her in trouble because what happened when Cheryl moved into the property, she knew that she wasn't supposed to. So she falsely reported rental income on her tax returns to make it look like the property she was living in was actually a rental. That is tax fraud. The government came in, they audited her transaction. They found that Cheryl was actually living in the property. She had never rented it out. And they decided to make an example out of Cheryl. They threw her in the slammer for 14 months for tax evasion related to her 1031 exchange. So ladies and gentlemen, if you're on this webinar, I can guarantee you that at some point you've probably had clients say, well, geez, how do I get around these rules, right? What do I do? Do you have an accommodator who is accommodating? They're asking you how to cheat. Well, I'm here to tell you that cheaters do go to jail, okay? Not all of them, 
But we do see clients who are penalized. They have to pay their taxes. They have to pay their interests. And in really egregious circumstances, the government does come in and put people in jail. Tax fraud is a criminal offense. So you want to make sure that the clients are following the rules. Now, from your perspective, you're the closing officer. You guys have no liability. But from our perspective, the 1031 exchange side, we really encourage our clients. We make sure that they take a conservative approach to the tax code. Some of our clients will follow our advice. Some of them won't. But it is our job on the exchange side to at least make sure that the clients know how to be in compliance with the tax code. So let's talk real quickly about that. How do you successfully complete a 1031 exchange in accordance with the guidelines set forth by the IRS? Well, there's four basic guidelines. And really, if our clients are following these four basic guidelines, they're going to be okay. Okay, we're going to talk about these four guidelines, and then I'm going to dig deeper into some of the closing issues that will come up when you guys are handling some of these transactions. Okay, so let's go over guideline number one. Guideline number one, everybody knows that when you do an exchange, the properties have to be held for productive use in trade or business or for investments. All right, so in order to even be eligible for an exchange, you have to have rented out your property or used it for investment or business purposes. You do not ever do an exchange on a property that you live in, right? Your primary residence, that's a different tax law. When you sell your primary residence, you're not going to exchange it. Now, there might be a situation where you rent out part of your primary residence, and part of your primary residence might be eligible for an exchange. We'll talk about that later. But you've got to have an investment component to the property. And not only that, is that we want to see investment component for at least one to two years for a property to be exchanged. Now, why the ambiguity? Is it one year or is it two years or is it 10 years? Well, the government simply doesn't tell us exactly how many days, weeks, months, or years the property must be rented out in order for it to be exchanged. But we know that there is some guidance that a one-year minimum could suffice. But really, if you're in California, which I am, you want to do it for two years because the California Tax Board is a lot more aggressive than the IRS. So if you are in California, I always recommend holding your properties that are involved in an exchange for two years as investment or business use properties. You do that, you should be okay. Now, what about properties that are vacation homes? Do vacation homes qualify for 1031? You have a client who comes in, they need to close in two weeks on a property in Lake Tahoe. And they say to you, hey, can I do an exchange on this? Well, what's your answer? I don't know. Call Leonard. Okay, that's a good answer. But if you want to give your clients a little bit more information, you can ask them a question. Well, this vacation rental that you have in Lake Tahoe, did you ever rent it out? Yeah, I have some rental activity on it. Okay, well, how much? Well, I rent it for the ski season. Okay, that's good. The next question is, how much did you personally use the property? Because if you've personally used the property too much, then it will not qualify for 1031 exchange. How much is too much? Well, ladies and gentlemen, on our vacation properties, in order for them to be eligible for 1031 exchange, you can personally use your property either 14 days per year or 10% of the amount of time it was rented out. So client comes in with a closing on their Lake Tahoe property. They tell you, yeah, they do rent it out. Perfect. Thumbs up. That's step one. Client says, I use my property 10 days a year. That's it. Okay. Then it will be eligible for 1031 exchange. Client says, well, I use my property 30 days per year. Okay. Well, this isn't going to work, right? We've exceeded our 14-day personal use limitation. But what about the 
Did the client rent the property out for 300 days? If so, they meet this 10% requirement. So vacation properties may or may not qualify for 1031 exchange. It really depends on how much they use them and how much they rented them out. Now again, easiest answer for your client to say, uh, easiest answer for you to give to your client is, well, it may qualify, call Leonard, and he'll walk you through the step-by-step -step process. Okay, so sometimes it's really not a clear-cut answer on whether or not a property is going to qualify. I'll give you another example. You've got uh, a farm, right? You got some land. Is that going to qualify? Client lives on the farm. Well, do they grow crops on the land? If so, that land could qualify for 1031 exchange. The value of that land is business use property and could be eligible for 1031 exchange, right? So sometimes the requirement of having a property used for trade or business isn't so clear cut. And that's when you wanna have a good resource who can ask the right questions, or at least maybe you know some of those right questions so that you can either eliminate them or take them on to the next stage, which might be talking to us or your favorite 1031, which hopefully will be us. All right, so step number one, make sure that property qualifies. Now, a couple other things within the 1031 exchange world. Foreign property is not like kind. So if you've got a client selling a property in Los Angeles and they want to buy in Mexico, that's not going to work. Client says, well, geez, I've got property in Mexico and I want to do an exchange into and buy property in Los Angeles. That's not going to work. When you sell property in the United States, you can only exchange property within the United States. All right. And then another thing is quick flips or development deals are not exchangeable, all right? The government considers quick flips and, in, and development deals inventory, and the tax code specifically prohibits inventory from being exchanged. So again, we look at that one to two year ownership requirement, but we also look at what did you do with the property? Did you rent it out? Did you use it in your in a business capacity? If all you did was bought it, fixed it up, and flipped it, well, that's not going to be exchangeable. Now, people try to exchange those properties all the time. We tell them, hey, you shouldn't be doing this, but they want to do it anyway. They swear up and down that their attorney and CPA said it's okay. Well, we can handle those deals because the tax code isn't clear cut on how long you have to own the property. But I always disclaim to my clients, hey, this is probably going to get disqualified if you get audited. So can you do an exchange on a quick flip? You probably shouldn't, but there is some gray area, right? Was it truly an investment? Well, I rented it for a little bit and then the tenant moved out, so I fixed it up and flipped it. Eh. Right? You might be able to make an argument, but by and large, a pure quick flip or pure development deal will get disqualified if you try to exchange that type of property. All right? Rule number one, make sure your properties qualify. If there's any confusion, pick up the phone, give us a call. Rule number two, and this is very important. People, even sophisticated investors, get this confused all the time. I have a client I'm talking to right now. They sold a $4.4 million apartment building. They've got about $1.7 million in, in gain or profit, and they thought that all they had to do was go out and buy a $1.7 million replacement property. They thought that all they had to do was spend the gain. Wrong, okay? If you do a 1031 exchange and you don't want to pay taxes, you need to do two things. Reinvest all the cash and purchase property equal or greater in value. All right, so this is where you guys come in, right? You're going to close the transaction for the seller and you're going to send over the cash, right? So you're going to send over a million bucks in cash and maybe the property sold for two million. Maybe it sold for three million, right? Requirement number one is that cash comes to the accommodator and the client uses that cash as a down payment to buy the replacement property. And the replacement property needs to be equal or greater in value to what they sold. All right, so you sold for two million and you've got a million dollars in cash. So you sold for two million, the million dollars is the down payment and you need to make sure that you're buying property for two million dollars or more. You remember those two things, reinvest all your cash, purchase property equal or greater in value, 
you defer all of your taxes. Now, sometimes clients will dig a little bit deeper, and we always tell clients this, but the, one of the good questions we get is, well, geez, Leonard, I paid my realtor a $100,000 commission, and I paid escrow fees and title fees and transfer taxes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, all those non-recurring closing costs can be deducted, right? So maybe you were in contract for 2.2, all right? But you paid 200 grand in non-recurring closing costs. You can subtract that to get to your net sales price for your exchange. And as long as you replace that net sale price, you're gonna be good to go. So how do I defer all my taxes? Well, I reinvest all my cash and I purchase property equal or greater in value. Rule number three, when you do your 1031 exchange, everybody knows this, you've got how many days to complete it? That's right, 180 days. So I've got 180 days to complete my exchange. The timing starts the day you close escrow on the sale property, and you're gonna go out and you need to make sure that you purchase and close on the replacement property on or before day 180. Now from an escrow closing perspective, the day that you record the sale is the day that we count as day zero. Now you might close and record on Friday, but the exchange wire that you're sending to me doesn't come until Monday or even Tuesday. Well, we're gonna count your exchange time frame from Friday. It's not Monday or Tuesday when we get the wire, it's Friday when you guys closed and record the transaction, all right? So very, very important. Day zero is the day that you closed, you got 180 days to purchase replacement property. And then what do you have to do on day 45? You've got to identify what you're thinking about buying. All right. This is the most challenging part of the exchange for our clients. They've got to go out and figure what they're going to buy, but they have to tell the government or they tell the government through us what they're thinking about buying via a written identification letter on day 45. So they're gonna sell something, they have to tell us what they're thinking about buying on or before day 45. And the way they fill out that identification letter is very important. There's two ways to fill out that identification letter. The first and most common way is to use what's called the three property rule. You can identify three properties of any value anywhere in the country. You've got one, two, three, and that's it. So on day 45, when you submit your list of three, you better be darn sure you can get something on that list because if property number one gets sold to someone else on day 46, you cannot replace it. If property number two burns to the ground on day 47, you cannot replace it. You've got one property on your list, and if you cannot get into that excuse me, if you cannot get into contract on that property, guess what? You've got a failed exchange and you pay taxes, all right? So most of our clients are using the three property rule because most of our clients will probably sell one, buy one, maybe sell one, buy two. And that works for a, a, about 95% of our clients, the three property rule. But every once in a while, we will have a client who says, well, geez, Leonard, I wanna go out and I wanna buy 10 properties, how do I do that? Well, you have to fill out your identification letter on day 45 using the 200% rule. And this is a ridiculous rule. Why did the government make it 200% and not 300% or 400%? Who knows, right? It just is what it is. But with this rule, the government says that you can nominate as many properties as you want. So here I've got six replacement properties that I've put down on my identification letter, and I'm allowed to put as many as I want, provided the total value of all this real estate does not exceed 200% of what I sold. So with the three property rule, I'm limited on the number of properties, and with this rule, I'm limited on the value. All right, so if I sell a building for 1 million bucks, how much real estate can I identify on my ID letter? 
That's right, $2 million worth of property. Now, we're going to guide the clients and we're going to consult with the clients to make sure that they understand these rules. But from a closing perspective, it's always good to have to be able to answer some of these questions that might come up about the exchange process. Who do I identify with? Do I identify to you? Where does my ID letter go? Well, it goes to your accommodator. And there's two ways to fill out that letter, right? Now, of course, we're going to be holding their hand the whole way. But again, these four basic guidelines, ladies and gentlemen, are going to get you through 95% of the questions you get regarding the 1031 exchange process. All right? Now, I have noticed that you guys haven't asked any questions yet, so I do want to remind you, if you do have questions that uh, you want to uh, get over to me, you just type them into your questions dialog box on your control panel, and it will pop up on my screen, and I'll try to answer your questions as they are appropriate. So let's dig into the meat and potatoes of some of the issues that, as an escrow or closing officer, you're going to get asked and that are going to come up on your specific desk, okay? And I think the number one issue that is going to come up for you guys, at least according to my team here when I asked them, is the same taxpayer requirement. Now, what is that? Well, the same taxpayer mean, requirement means that if Leonard Spoto, that's me, if Leonard Spoto sells a property, Leonard Spoto needs to buy it. Okay, it's the same taxpayer that sells that needs to complete the exchange and buy replacement property. But there's different variations of that, right? So sometimes you'll have a single person. Well, sometimes you'll have a married person. So Leonard and his wife, V, we sold a property. Well, what if we want to buy property to complete the exchange? That works, right? What if Leonard Spoto sells the property and Leonard and V Spoto buy replacement property? That doesn't work. All right. And this is kind of nitpicky, but what happens is the franchise tax board gets nitpicky and they use these little technicalities to disqualify exchanges. So the safest thing for Leonard Spoto to do if he's the one selling the property is he should be the one buying property. Can he add his wife? Well, maybe, but it's safer not to, right? If Leonard Spoto sold a million dollar property, and Leonard and V Spoto go out and buy a million dollar property, guess what? The franchise tax board could say, well, geez, Leonard didn't complete his exchange because now he only owns 50% of a million dollar property. And what is that? That's $500,000 worth of real estate. Well, geez, he sold for a million and now he bought for 500. So he's got a tax bill to pay. So safest thing to do in this situation is if single person owned real estate prior to getting married and never added his wife to the property, a couple things you can do. Number one, you can add the wife to the sale property, do a corrective deed, get V and her name on there, and then you sell as a married couple, you buy as a married couple. The other thing you could do is if you don't have time to do that, you just sell as an single person and you get V to agree, hey, you don't need to be on title to that property for the exchange for at least a year or two so that we don't have any problems with the IRS or the franchise tax board. And then after two years, we can go ahead and add V to title. This comes up all the time, ladies and gentlemen, and people hate this issue. The wife or the, or the spouse who who's got the single property, they're okay with doing the exchange on their own, but the other spouse says, hey, what the heck? Why can't I go on title? All right? We want to make sure everything's as clean as possible, so keep that in mind with married couples. Let's look at another scenario. We've got Leonard and V, married couple. They uh, are selling a property, but something goes wrong, God forbid, and they're in a divorce. And now V says, well, geez, I want to take my half and I just want to go out and complete an exchange on my own. Well, what do you think about that? Well, that's a unique scenario. As long as we have a divorce decree and there's a true divorce situation, we shouldn't have a problem with that. All right. So married couples can 
get complex if there's divorces, right? But they should have the flexibility to do their exchanges independent because now they're not going to be married anymore. That makes sense. All right, let's take it up a notch. Same taxpayer requirement still. Let's go a little bit crazier. We've got Leonard and V, married couple. That's me and my wife. We sold a property in our name, and now we're going to buy in the name of our trust. Now, I will tell you that most revocable trusts are what we call disregarded entities, meaning they do not file their own tax return. So I've got married couples selling. They're filing their taxes jointly. They go out and they buy in the name of their trust. Now, I'm going to guess half of you are going to say that's okay, and the other half of you are going to say that's a problem. Well, how does it pan out? This is actually okay. Because what we care about here, ladies and gentlemen, is that the taxpayer is the same. This taxpayer is the exact same as this taxpayer because, as I mentioned, this disregarded, excuse me, this revocable trust does not file its own tax return. So a revocable trust for tax purposes, for 1031 exchange purposes, doesn't even exist. Just doesn't even exist. Make sense? All right, let's go and take a look at the next situation. All right, we've got Leonard Spoto. Me, I sell. I go out and buy in my revocable trust. Is that a problem? It is. Because the revocable trust contains my wife, right? So we've got a problem in that situation as well, right? I've got my single property, the condo that I owned in the city when I was single and young, and now I got married and I moved out and we got a tenant in there. I never added my wife to title. I'm doing an exchange and I want to put the new property in the trust. That's a problem. Okay. So there's a couple ways we can rectify that. We kind of talked about that earlier. We can add the wife to the title on the sale property, or we just put the new property in my name for a year or two and then move it over into the trust. Let's take another look. Okay, I have kids, ladies and gentlemen. Let me introduce you to my son, Sebastian. Actually, today is his birthday. He's turning five today. I've got a seven-year-old daughter. These kids are the beneficiaries of my trust, all right? I'm going to set up this trust. The trust is on title to the sale property. We've got a nice rental home, and it's in the trust, doing everything that the attorneys tell us we should do. We're going to do an exchange, and we're going to buy in the trust. Is that okay? Absolutely. All right. Same taxpayer, right? And I'm sorry, I missed it. One of the most important things here is, oops, this trust becomes irrevocable because my wife and I kicked the bucket, right? So we had a revocable trust and now my wife and I had kicked the bucket and the trust becomes irrevocable, meaning it can't be changed. So when my wife and I pass away, the trust becomes irrevocable. My kids can't go in there and fiddle-faddle with it and change it. And guess what? The trust is its own taxpayer at that point. So what happens is the trust is going to sell the property, and the trust has to buy replacement property to complete the exchange. Now, the problem is what happens in a lot of situations is mom and dad kick the bucket. The kids keep the property in the irrevocable trust, right? So they're selling in the irrevocable trust, but the only one who wants to do the exchange is one of the kids. So Sebastian says, you know what? I'm going to do the exchange. Sis, you don't have to just take your cash, pay taxes. Well, guess what? That's a problem. So Sebastian tries to buy replacement property in his name well, we sold as one taxpayer, and now we're buying as a different taxpayer, and we all know the IRS does not like that. So these vesting issues come up all the time. They're big deals, and they blow up exchanges all the time. Um, they get even more complex, so we're going to go over some of those. Um, before we do, Sandy, I got your question. Floating homes do not qualify for 1031 exchange unless they are 
permanently moored. All right, so let's go over some more complex issues with our same taxpayer requirements. So we've got our revocable trust. We know that revocable trusts are disregarded, so for tax purposes, they don't exist. So the revocable trust sells, and then we put a new entity together, an LLC, to buy. Is that allowed? It is. Because as I've mentioned here, LLCs are also single member LLCs or LLCs with just husband and wife are also disregarded entities. They don't exist for tax purposes, for 1031 exchange purposes. These two entities here, if they're disregarded entities, they don't even exist. So it's fine to sell in the name of your revocable trust and buy in the name of your LLC as long as it's the same taxpayer, which they are, because these are not unique taxpayers. Okay, let's throw a couple other scenarios at you. Spoto LLC sells, Leonard and V Spoto buy. Is that allowed? Absolutely. Again, Spoto LLC is disregarded, doesn't exist. Okay, now Matt, my sales guy and I, we see a beautiful building we want to buy together. So Matt and I form an LLC to buy the building and we've owned it for 10 years. And we say, hey, let's sell this building now. We're making a ton of money. Guess what? Because Matt and I are not related, we're not married, we've got a multi-member LLC. Okay, two or more unrelated parties owning an LLC together are by definition going to have a unique taxpaying entity. So this LLC has its own taxpayer ID number, and when that unique LLC sells the building, it's gonna have to buy replacement property. So I alone could not do it. Okay, last and final scenario, Leonard Spoto sells, and, we, and Matt and I wanna buy the building underneath our LLC, that does not work. So the issue, the number one issue I get when I'm dealing with commercial transactions is I would say 65 to 75% of the time, the properties that the clients are selling are wrapped up and owned in a multi-member LLC and the partners wanna go their own way and buy independently. That doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Taxpayers aren't the same. So we have to do what are called a drop and swap where we drop out of the LLC prior to the sale and then we swap individual interests. And you guys probably get asked about this all the time, right? Can I make these title changes right before the sale so that we can do our exchanges or whatever? Well, you can, but they're risky. If I drop out of this LLC while I'm in escrow, so I take a 50% tenant in common position in the property and Matt takes a 50% tenant in common position and we get rid of that LLC and we do it right before the closing, that's risky. Because now the franchise tax board comes in and says, well, geez, Leonard, you did an exchange on a property that you only owned for 30 days. And I say, what? What the heck are you talking about? I've owned this property for 10 years with Matt. And the franchise tax board says, nope, you, the LLC owned the property. You individually didn't own it long enough to season it as an exchangeable property. And then they disallow the exchange. The safest thing for Matt and I to do would be to break up that LLC a year or two prior to selling it, drop down into tenant in common ownership positions, season those tenant in common ownership positions for a year or two, and then sell the property. Now, how many of our clients do that? Very few. But that's the safest way to do it. Especially if you're working on a $25 million sale or a $50 million sale, which some of our clients are. All right? So these issues are very important because they come up at the closing table a day before you're trying to record. What do you do? Well, clients are either going to take the risk, it's going to fail the exchange, or they're going to have to buy replacement property with a partner. 
and maybe they just don't like that guy anymore. Very, very important issues. All right, let's take a look at this. I pulled a closing statement from a property that uh, we worked on not too long ago. I, I blacked out some uh, privacy concern uh, information here. The client's name was down there, so I blacked that out. Take a look at this closing statement. From a 1031 exchange perspective, is there anything weird or unique about this closing statement? Boom, right here. Take a look at that last line. Cash boot. Client wants $100,000, not the end of the world. Clients can always choose to do a partial exchange and take cash out at closing. Hopefully, they told you about it, but half the time they probably don't, right? So we'll communicate with you when we know a client wants to take boot out. You're going to withhold, obviously, on the boot, the money that doesn't come to us, you're going to do your three and a third withholding if you're in California and other states have or maybe don't have withholding, but most, a lot of them do. Um, but we see this all the time and uh, clients want to take cash out. Absolutely a possibility. And it's always a good thing at closing. If you're dealing with a, an exchanger, ask them, hey, do you want any boot? Right? Because sometimes clients don't tell you and then they scream at you at the last minute because you were supposed to read their mind, right? I mean, who, who hasn't been there? So always good communication. You know, one of the first things that you think of if you're a closer is, hey, you doing an exchange, you going to take any boot or is it all coming over to the exchange company? All right, so that's an important one. Okay, another closing statement. This is a different property. This was a nice big $8 million property that closed. Um, let's take a look at this closing statement. Does anyone, anyone see anything funky on this closing statement from a 1031 exchange perspective? Of course you don't, right? Because you're not 1031 exchange people. So let me point it out to you. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen. We have got closing statement items that they want to pay, interest on tenant security deposit. They want to pay $35,000 in deposits and they owe some rent to the buyer. Okay, these items are a red flag from an exchange perspective because you cannot use 1031 exchange funds to pay non-recurring closing costs. I mean, excuse me, yes, that's correct. So these items on the closing statement are going to be considered boot. And that's okay as long as the client is aware that this amount of money here is going to be taxable. So you've got a big chunk of change that the CPA is going to have to report as taxable boot because you took money out from the exchange to pay for something that wasn't allowed to be paid for in the exchange. Now, so two options for that. The client says, well, who cares? We'll just pay it excuse me, we'll just pay it out of the sale proceeds and we'll deal with the taxes. Not a big deal. The other way to deal with it is the client brings this amount of money to the closing table. So they replace that amount of money with their own cash. They just take those out of the uh, closing statement. You don't pay those with sale proceeds and the client pays with his own or her own money. All right, so there are certain things on a closing statement that should not be paid for with sale proceeds if they want a 100% deferred exchange. Let's look at one other item on a closing statement that could cause a tax liability for our client. Real quick, does anyone see it? Boom, right there. When you do a 1031 exchange, you can use your exchange dollars to pay for non-recurring closing costs, but not anything related to the loan. So we have two things on here that are lender related. Number one is a $4,000 fee to the bank that's loaning them the money. And then the second thing is a reserve of $48,000. So this client's buying some kind of 
apartment building or something and the lender's charging a $4,000 fee and they're also saying, hey, you need to fund a reserve account of $48,000. And they're trying to do that with sale proceeds. So they're using their exchange proceeds to pay for things that they're not supposed to. Now, my team at my company is awesome, okay? So we're going to point this out to the client. And in fact, Janelle in my office, if you've worked with her, you know she's fantastic. She said, whoa, whoa, whoa. If you use your exchange dollars to pay for these two things, you're going to have a tax bill. The client said, ooh, I don't want a tax bill. So they brought their own money to the table. All right, so if you don't catch it, not the end of the world, we review those closing statements and uh, we will catch it. Now, some of them are just so small, we don't mention them to clients. And I'll tell you, clients get mad too. What do you mean I can't pay for this? Blah, blah, blah. And those are not fun conversations to have. So if you see that on a closing statement and you just don't want to have that conversation with the client because the client's a jerk, send them over to us, say, Say, hey, Janelle or Leonard, you know, I, I saw this on the closing statement. Can you talk to the client about that? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's our job. That's what we get paid to do, right? So just something for you guys to be aware of when you're, when you're drawing up your closing statements. All right. Another thing that happens, you guys are working on closings and the client comes in and says, well, I'm selling this building, but my buyer, he wants me to carry a note. Oh, and by the way, I'm doing an exchange. Red flag should go up right away. Red flag goes up. Seller financing, 1031 exchange, ugh, not the best thing. Okay, two ways to deal with the seller who is carrying a note. Number one, do not include the note in the exchange and you pay taxes on it. All right, I'm selling a million dollar building and I'm carrying a $100,000 note. All right, not the end of the world. I'll just pay taxes on it. Or option two, include the note in the exchange by showing asset exchange company as the beneficiary. All right. What happens then? Well, a couple options. You can use the seller, the, excuse me, our exchange client, can use the note towards the down payment on the replacement property. You got a note sitting in your exchange account. You say, hey, I'll use it as a down payment to buy my property. Okay, that never happens. Technically, it's possible, doesn't ever happen, all right? Option number two, the exchanger simply purchases the note out of the exchange account. Okay, that works. We've got a $100,000 note sitting in the exchange account. Our client says, you know what? I'll buy it out. I'll put my own cash in. That effectively is the only or usually the only way that clients deal with a seller financing note in an exchange. Because the other options, using it for the replacement property down payment, that's not feasible. Um, getting the buyer to pay off the note prior to closing on the replacement property, that's probably not possible. If the client had the money, they probably wouldn't need to carry a note. And then selling it on the secondary market. You got this $100,000 note sitting in the exchange account. You find someone else to buy it. Well, that's usually not an option because if you have a $100,000 note, an investor will probably want to buy it for $60,000. And most of our clients, they say, no, nah, I think I'll pass on that. The point of this conversation right here and right now is that if you have an exchange client, a seller doing an exchange, and they're telling you, hey, I'm carrying a note, red flag goes up. Red flag goes up, call Leonard, all right? Because you're going to have to figure out how you want to deal with that note. Pay taxes, replace it with cash. Those are usually the two most practical options for our clients. Another issue. Oh, I hate this issue. Please just make this one go away. Foreign sellers. They want to do an exchange. But you guys at the closing table have to withhold the 15%. Client says, well, I'm doing an exchange. You don't have to withhold 15%, right? Wrong. You do, unless the seller goes out and gets a withholding certificate issued by the IRS. Okay? They say, hey, I don't have the withholding certificate, but I didn't, but I applied for it. Well, that's fine. You don't have to withhold right away. 
You can delay, but they have to put written notice of their application and provide it to you, the closing officer. Now, when our clients are going to go out and get this withholding certificate, they've got to go do it through the IRS through Form 8288. The foreign seller also must have a taxpayer identification number, and it generally takes about four to six weeks. So what happens on these deals, and this is why I hate them, is a client calls me up and says, Leonard, do an exchange, set up an exchange account. I email you guys for the documents, and then you tell me, oh, this guy's not even a, uh, a U.S. resident. And I say, oh, geez, do they have a taxpayer ID number? I don't know. I don't think so. Ugh. Okay, well, you're going to have to withhold the 15%. Client's furious about it because it's 15% of the sale price, right? So it's a million-dollar property. How much are you guys going to withhold? Okay, client hates that. 150 grand is withheld. How they can do their exchange now when 150 grand is gone? Well, it's harder. So what do you do? Well, you're going to withhold the 15% in most cases. And then the option for the clients, they're either going to just pay taxes on that as boot because it's not going into the exchange, or they're going to replace that amount with their own cash. And if they want to do that, the best thing for the foreign seller to do is send the money to you prior to closing. You have to withhold 150. Okay, have the client send you 150, and then you can send everything over to me. Okay, if they can't come up with the funds, we can take the 150 after close, but prior to them purchasing their replacement property. Ladies and gentlemen, you probably know this. This foreign 15% usually just kills the deal. Client says, you know what, forget it. i just not going to exchange now. Okay, but they have options. They're not awesome options because they take planning or they take cash. But they do have options. All right, so again, red flag goes up. Seller is a foreigner and trying to do an exchange. All I want you to remember is that red flag goes up and my phone number. Because we'll, we'll deal with the issue with the client. It's good for you to spot. Okay, you look like a rock star. Okay, because you averted this big issue, and hopefully we can get them to uh, have a have a good, valid, 100% tax deferred exchange. All right, what else do we got? I promise we're going to wrap up. I'm having fun. Hopefully you guys are having fun too. Deposits. Okay, client receives an early release of a deposit when they're selling the property. Oh no! I just touched my money. I blew the exchange. Well, no, not necessarily, right? You can always take money out and just pay taxes on it as boot, or you can just send it back to us, right? It's an early release. You didn't close yet. You do not have sale proceeds because the sale has not closed. So client gets an early release of $50,000 and they want to do an exchange, either wire it back or just pay taxes on that 50000 as boot. Okay, not the end of the world. That probably comes up with your closing desks all the time, right? Okay, where am I? Okay, this is, we're going to transition into even some more advanced issues here, and I promise we're going to end in seven minutes, okay? So let's blow through some of these. Ladies and gentlemen, you got to talk to your clients when they're selling investment property and ask them, hey, are you doing an exchange? Client may say, ah, no, I have no gain. What do you mean you have no gain? Well, I bought the property for a million and I sold it for a million, so I have no profit. I don't have any taxes. Are you sure? Because when you do an exchange and you own investment property, there is something called a depreciation recapture tax. If you have depreciated your property, even if you haven't made a profit on it, if you have depreciated your property, there is a 25% tax on the depreciation. So you might not have any profit, but you have, in this case, a $50,000 depreciation tax bill at the federal level and a $20,000 state tax bill to pay. 
but I didn't make any money. Yeah, but you have owned this property for 15 years and you've been taking depreciation every year, which is a huge tax benefit. The government wants to tax you. Again, this is a pretty advanced issue. If you don't know what the heck I'm talking about, you're like, what the heck, depreciation? What is that concept? I heard it back in Real Estate 101. Well, it's, a, it's an issue. And it is a compelling issue for our clients to consider an exchange, right? So keep in the back of your mind, client says, well, I don't have any profit. Okay, that's good. But what about depreciation? All right, another situation that comes up all the time, you've got a client who has a two unit building. Client lives in the bottom unit and they rent out the top. You're at the closing table and you have to, Tell the client, geez, I've got to withhold on this portion of the property. Well, not if you do an exchange. Does the client want to do an exchange? Maybe, right? Good conversation to have. You might have just saved that client hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes, right? Any investment component to your property can be exchanged. It could be 50%. It could be 5%. It could be 80% right? If they use their primary residence also for some kind of investment or business purpose, they can exchange that portion. I had a real estate agent in San Francisco sell a $5 million home that she lived in. 10% of that home was her home office. Guess what? She did an exchange on that 10% and saved herself about $100,000 in taxes. All right. I don't know what I'm talking about here. Let's skip this slide. Uh, reverse exchange. Just keep reverse exchanges in mind. They're terrible to work on. Everybody hates them. I'm sure you guys hate them as much as we do, but they do allow your clients to buy first and then sell. The problem is we generally structure exchanges where my company takes title to the replacement property. So if you have a client who's closing and they're buying something and they're saying, oh, by the way, this is going to be part of a reverse exchange. Well, you all should know not to put that property in the client's name. It's generally going to go into the name of the exchange company. So just a red flag on reverse exchanges, right? The exchange company is normally the buyer of the replacement property for the client. Okay, same thing happens in a construction exchange. Did you know that those even existed? Client could buy land and use their sale proceeds to build on that land and get a nice property at the end of the construction. Problem is we become the buyer of the land on behalf of the client. We disperse funds out for the improvements and we only transfer the completed property to the client once day 180 is done or the construction is done right so two scenarios where we take title to property for clients number one reverse exchange number two construction exchange and what else do we got okay just quick update before we end here taxes they're ugly um, we pay taxes to the federal government and to the state government these are our federal taxes You've got either a 15 or a 20% capital gains tax. You've got a 25% depreciation recapture tax, as what I was telling you. You also have a Medicare tax of 3.8% at the federal level. State of California, if you're sitting in the sunshine state like I am, taxes start at about 9.3%, but go as high as 12.3%. Forget all that, okay? Don't need to know it. What you do need to know is your clients in California or selling California real estate will pay about 33% in total taxes on the sale of investment property. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why the 1031 exchange is so powerful. It keeps a third of their wealth in their pocket. That's fantastic, right? All right, I've talked and talked and talked and talked too much, so now we're gonna wrap up, all right? 
So my name again is Leonard Spoto. If you don't know me, I know I see some familiar uh, names on our RSVP list. Um, thank you so much for attending. If you think this presentation would benefit the rest of your team, let me know. We can come and visit your team and give this presentation. We can do another webinar specifically for your office or your escrow association or whomever you might think it would benefit. The only thing that we ask is you think of us for your clients' exchanges. Okay, If you have a client who's got an exchange question, if they need to open up an exchange account, get a hold of me or get a hold of my sales team. We are very, very happy to work with you guys, and I think my team's awesome. Um, I'm sure if you work with us, you'll think the same. And if you don't, let me know. I'll fire them, right? I'm the boss. <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you all very much. Have a fantastic rest of your afternoon, and give yourself a pat on the back for joining today. Uh, you learned a lot, and I'm sure you're going to be a much better closing officer because of it. Have a fantastic afternoon, everybody, and look forward to working with all of you very soon.